Now, there will be lots of opportunity for discussion uh, throughout the, the, the two days, and particularly today, um, after our theological perspectives, we're going to be having uh, some time spent in group discussion, and then we'll have a plenary session at the end of the day uh, for an hour-long discussion with Robin and our theological contributors as well. Um, so if you're thinking, I've only got 15 minutes to discuss this topic, Sorry. no, you haven't. You've got lots of time mm -hmm. uh, to discuss it throughout the day. Um, I was very happy to uh, watch the progress, Robin, in, in your talks, uh, particularly to indicate to everyone what I was saying earlier on, uh, that you genuinely aren't a mad scientist, that um, scientists who take this work seriously uh, think seriously about the implications, uh, some of the problems and potentially some of the solutions as well. Uh, so I think the, the, you know, the last half dozen or so of your slides are particularly pertinent to, to the rest of our time together. But we are going to have about 15 minutes before we need some refueling at lunch. Uh, I am going to ask you, please, not to make comments or ask questions about the status of the human embryo or about the legality or morality of uh, using human embryos in, in research. Those are very important topics, but that's not what we're discussing at the present time. Uh, particularly in this session, if you can phrase a comment or a question around the, the scientific rather than the ethical or the, the social aspects of what Robin has said, that would be useful because we will, we will pick up those other aspects later. So, uh, not just questions, but comments that you might want to make. Um, again, uh, Julia, do you have the mic? Yep. Uh, we have the microphone ready. Just raise your hand and... If you haven't been bludgeoned into submission, that's all right, Peter. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much for your uh, talk, and uh, I agree. You you certainly do not come forward as a mad scientist. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, but still, I think there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, Slight, slightly mad. <laughs> I, I think there probably are some issues here where we uh, uh, disagree. But I, right now, I'll just uh, refrain myself to a very simple question of uh, clarification. Um, I'm left with with the impression, and this, this, I'm, I'm asking this question as a, as a non scientist. Uh, I'm left with the impression that research on uh, gene editing. Uh, can only be done on um, on 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 uh, fertilized eggs. Uh, so, so I, I I respect that that you want to mm -hmm. to to put a, a discussion, uh, an ethical mm -hmm. discussion for for later. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. But then this is my clarifying question. So, it, it can is that true that that it it can so. Where they come from, that's a different question, but yeah. it can o is it true that it can only be done on fertilized eggs? Well, it, it depends what the research specific question you're asking. So if you're asking about the developing the methods and making them efficient and knowing that you have targeted the, 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 the right place in the genome, the right gene, then you can do a lot of that work on cell lines. So you can do a lot of that on embryonic stem cell lines or IPS cell lines or if it's possible to culture spermatogonial stem cells from humans on, on those. Um, and that, so you can certainly test out the components and make sure that you have things working very efficiently. Um, if you, your route to um, the germline is to manipulate the early embryo, then obviously you have to have early embryos to manipulate. Um, if, your, if your route is via um, the precursors of, of sperm or eggs, then I say you could do some of that with iPS cells. And that there are, I should say that there are, there are <coughs> quite a few labs who are trying to develop ways of deriving um, eggs or sperm from these pluripotent stem cell lines, from iPS cells. Um, they're doing that for other reasons, of course. They're doing it to allow people who, for example, cancer patients, children who've had cancer who've been treated for their cancer are now infertile because of that treatment, to allow those individuals to have children. If you could take a skin biopsy, turn it into an iPS cell, then make eggs or sperm uh, as appropriate. So the, those methods are being developed independently. And if they work, then you could essentially do that for anyone um, as a way of allowing them to have a 
genetically un you know, a, a, a child uh, who isn't going to have a disease. Spermatogonial stem cells seems a little simpler because you can begin be, begin with this stem cell population that's um, going to make sperm um, naturally. Um, uh, putting her back into the testes of the individual might be doable. I mean, we can do that in mice. It's possible that it would work in humans. It works in monkeys, so it probably would work. So you could test, and if you're doing it that route, let's say you can essentially test everything that's going to work um, in cells in culture before you make an embryo. At some point, you're going to still have to make an embryo to <coughs> prove that it has worked and that it's, everything is fine. But yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then if, if there's anyone on this side of the room, because all our questions have, <laughs> have tended to come over here, uh, we've got one person in the back. And anyone on this side of the room got a point or a question you want to ask or make? There's one at the back. But, yeah. Um, I'm still, still on the wrong side of the room. Can you move over to this <laughs> oh, side I, of the room just to make me feel better? I would like to propose to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, the question at the front here first. Oh, I, yeah. I could move. Uh, a brief no. comment and a question. A brief comment on your comment towards uh, the uh, report of the American National Academies. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth noting that uh, the report made a slight but important shift. Uh, having in mind uh, the so-called Washington Summit uh, mm -hmm. by the end yeah. of 2015, um, there was um, an agreement that only under the condition, firstly, of taking all the risk, and secondly, uh, taking seriously into account mm -hmm. uh, the discussion in the general public yes. uh, should be a prerequisite for uh, going ahead with uh, all the research. And this has slightly, but importantly, changed uh, yeah. in the report uh, of the National Academies. And it were it just primarily focused uh, on the scientific questions and the general public did not play the same important role it had uh, in the Washington Summit Declaration. I, I think that's worth to know, especially I'll, I if can we... comment on that, yeah. So uh, yeah. I was involved in both. In both, um, yeah. Then I'm, I'm um, really looking forward to, <laughs> <laughs> to your interpretation um, of this uh, as far as I read uh, the both papers. Um, so you are, you are right that the... Um, so the statement that came out after the December 2015 Washington... DC summit meeting. Um, that that whole meeting had a public facing um, process, if you like, um, involved the public. And um, but the statement the statement was written by the organisers of the meeting, and I was one of the organisers of the meeting. Um, so it wasn't really reflecting the, the views of everyone at the meeting. It was just sort of a synthesis, perhaps in our heads, that roughly f we felt may may fit. Um, the report um, was a much more detailed, extensive uh, discussion of all the issues, and there was some involvement of in the public in that process, actually. Um, um, and uh, the, the, the views of the, the, the committee that wrote the report were much more diverse than the views of the committee that actually wrote the original statement. So it's, you would have thought that it would have been the other way around, in a way, but it wasn't. Everyone signed up to it, even those who are quite concerned about the prospects of genome editing. The, the reason they signed up was because of the considerations we make about regulation. So if it is regulated appropriately, they felt reassured. So that was really what was important. We didn't make any statement about regulation properly at the, the summit meeting. Um, it is, um, we say in the report also, though, that still nothing should go ahead without proper public consultation, the involvement of the public in, in making decisions. And so there are, there are several bodies who are trying to um, directly involve the project, the public, in trying to get a, an understanding of what the public think about um, these issues. It's hard to do because it's hard to do without some information. So you have to give information to the public in a very neutral, unbiased way. There are two, two, two sort of small public engagement exercises that, that have been published already, uh, a small one in the, in the UK for a very biased 
biased group of, of public. They were affected by either infertility problems or genetic disease, but, and, a, and a more more broader group in the U.S. Interestingly, in both cases, um, the, the members of the public didn't really distinguish between somatic genome editing and heritable germline genome editing, and they both thought both were good on, on the whole. Um, we've just, as part of the Royal Society, we've just done another one, another study, and I, I'm, I can't talk about the results yet because they're not published, but they will be published on the 7th of March. Uh, but I can give you a little headline that actually the same thing happened. So the members of the public broadly did not distinguish the two. They could see there was value in the, gene, the heritable genome editing as much as it was in the somatic. And just, yeah. just to clarify, because I, I need to move on, uh, Peter, if you don't mind, just to clarify, th those surveys were UK and USA? This last one, the Royal Society one, was just UK. It was part of a much bigger program looking at genome editing in plants and animals as well. But it was UK-based, and it was a survey, and also um, focus groups where you had two groups of... You had a group of people who came back on two separate occasions with a two-week gap in between who were given lots of information in an unbiased way um, and came to the, their own conclusion. We could, we could discuss. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. I'm, no, I'm yes, going you, to. You have other questions. I have uh, a question, but just. Uh, I, For, very quickly, I, I can, can refrain we, from it, but more. just want to uh, uh, give the information that there has been published also a third very big survey. Uh, in Nature Biotechnology by end of 2017 mm -hmm. on the European perspectives, very close to the yeah. Eurobarometer uh, yeah. um, by Gaskell uh, yeah. and others. Sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And you have helpfully moved to the other side of the room. Thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Makes us feel so much better up here. I have a very simple question which will... Uh, which is a, a question of a non-scientific. Non I tried to follow and concentrate on, on what you were saying. And if I heard you well, you said that the modification of genes, uh, that the, the more aged fathers are responsible for this modification. And what about feminine cells? I have not understood if the ah. masculine cells are more important than feminine. Because no, 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 no. women no, are no, older no, no. and older to have babies. <laughs> um. So when, um, if you're looking at the types of mutation that, that occur and that affect children, um, if it's a, a, small, a small point mutation, so very small changes in the DNA sequence, actually it's the, the, it's the contribution of the father that seems to be the more, more relevant. So younger fathers, maybe on average 40 mutations, older fathers about 80. Um, if you look at the contribution from the mother's side, uh, there are some. Uh, small, these point mutations, small mutations. But the bigger problem is, of course, uh, chromosomal abnormalities, things like Down syndrome, um, Turner syndrome, which I increase dramatically um, as, the, as the mother ages uh, because the eggs are, of course, aging um, and you get these chromosomal problems. So that's a different thing. But you do get contributions from both sides of the, the point mutations. But the the man is the, the, the offender most often in that, in that case. Thank you. Um, one more question o over here. Um, we'll not apportion blame, just responsibility. Maybe that's a, that's a thought, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I have three short questions. Uh, the first one is, um, how much time do you think will pass till we have the first like, clini clinical studies? On, so, the yes. germ line, on the germline. Yes, that's right. And. Uh, Maybe I put the three together. Many uh, scientific said that there should be a moratorium for such application. And what do you think about the chances of such a moratorium? And third question, is it so that there are not, or how are the security regulations for this, for the scientific Okay. things because I've heard that there are not, not so special regulations and so anybody can do it and there is not any real regulation about it. Okay, let me try and do this. So time it's impossible to guess. Um, it's, you know, it, could happen, it could happen next year um, but it would have to be in a country that, the, that was permissive. Uh, people always say China would be the first one. I'm not so sure because they are pushing the technology very fast 
Um, but they and they don't they don't have laws governing things. They don't have laws governing lots of aspects of, of medical treatment, for example. But they have very precise guidelines. And and to do do make a heritable genome editing, make a, a change in the, that could be heritable, um, is um, against the guidelines at the moment. So and if you break the guidelines in China, you can be in serious trouble. So I'm not sure it's going to be that, but it, it could be. Um, um, we certainly, I don't think we're there yet. I think a lot more work has to be done. So, but perhaps five years, but I, it's really hard to give a, a, a specific time. Um, so your second question, I have such a bad memory. Your second question was about a uh, moratorium. So initially there were, um, so when the issues were sort of first raised, they actually wasn't quite the first, but they were raised, there, were, there was one article published in Nature, um, where a group of scientists um, said there should be moratorium, it should be, shouldn't be allowed. Um, there was another paper published in Science around the same time where it didn't call for moratorium, it didn't use that word, it just said it has to be very cautious. Um, the first group, actually, if you look at who they were, they were all working for somatic genome editing companies, and if one is suspicious, one might think they were worried about... Um, the, the, the value of their stock and value and, and um, uh, future investment into their companies from people who are worried about prospects of making germline genome edits. And actually, when you talk to those individuals, some of those individuals which I have, that is, was indeed their, their concern. So um, you have to be a little careful interpreting some of those statements. As we've gone on, and we, we talked a little bit about the difference between the, the statement put out at the end of 2015 after the summit meeting and our, um, the report published a year ago, there have subsequently been other statements put out by various uh, organizations, for example, the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology, together with the European Society of Human Genetics. Um, and th they are not calling for moratorium. They are much more, again, permissive. <laughs> Um, so most scientists, I think, now are feeling that, well, this is going to happen. Uh, if it's going to happen, then it should be regulated properly and done properly. Um, and so the, that's, that's why they've been cautious. And the third question. Oh, security. We had a meeting, we had a meeting in Hanover in uh, October, I think it was, um, which was specifically addressing questions of security around genome editing. That wasn't just human, but that was plant and animal and everything. And surprisingly, few concerns came up that people felt generally that current regulations uh, deal with most of the issues. Of course, you can't, you can't regulate against rogue states or rogue individuals, but, um, uh, but you know, there was no, it was felt that there was no huge leap in terms of the problems that genome editing causes compared with more conventional methods. So you can do nasty things with viruses. Um, so why worry about genome editing? See what I mean? So. Okay, thank you very much. That's the end of our morning sessions. Um, thank you, Robin. Thank you, everyone, for contributing. Thank you for bending your own grey matter to follow all of the tricky bits and pieces there as well. Lots more discussion to come. We're back at three o'clock uh, with our theological perspectives, then group discussion, and then a plenary discussion where we can try to bring all of this together. Uh, so again, please, one more time, show your appreciation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.